Good afternoon. For those of you unfamiliar with my work, every year I read through every issue of every English language nutrition journal in the world, so you don't have to. Every year my talks are brand new because every year the science is brand new. I then compile all the most interesting, most groundbreaking, most practical findings and new videos and articles I upload every day to my website, nutritionfacts.org, as was mentioned. Um, uh, everything on the website is free. There's no ads, no corporate sponsorship, strictly non-commercial, not selling anything. Just put it up as a public service. New video, new, the latest um, in nutritional science every day. For those of you who've seen uh, my talks in the past, um, and I've been to New York a number of times, you know I've addressed some of the most pressing dietary issues of our time. Like, what's the best variety of apple to eat? Or what's the most nutritious nut? Or the best bean? Or the best berry? Or the best bowel movement? I don't know if you remember this from the... Who's number one and number two? Well, it wasn't the New Yorkers. Actually, the most constipated population ever studied in the medical literature, seriously, outputting a mere three ounces a day. If Maybe if you all just eat a big apple once in a while. <clears throat> but I thought this year I'd lighten it up and ask, what's the best way to prevent death? Every year, the CDC lists the top 15 causes of death in the United States. I said, well, let's just go through the list. 1 through 15, talk about the role diet may play in preventing, treating, and even reversing our top 15 killers. Killer number one is heart disease. A, um, the International Journal of Epidemiology recently, they reprinted this landmark article from the 1950s that started out with a shocking statement. The statement was, in the African population of Uganda, coronary heart disease is almost non-existent. Our number one killer, number one killer of men and women in this country, number one killer almost non-existent? What were they eating? Oh, they were eating uh, lots of vegetables, um, uh, uh, green leafy vegetables taken by all. And the protein in the diet was almost exclusively from plant sources. Um, and they had the cholesterol to prove it. Um, actually, very similar to what you see in kind of modern day plant eaters. But uh, look, maybe they were just um, dying early from other diseases, didn't live long enough to get heart disease. Well, let's see. Here's age-matched heart attack rates, Uganda versus St. Louis. All right, out of 632 autopsies in Uganda, one myocardial infarction. All right, out of 632 Missourians, same age and gender distribution, there were 136 myocardial infarctions. Right? More than 100 times the rate of our number one killer. In fact, they were so blown away, um, they went and did another 1,000, um, uh, and uh, still, out of 1,427 uh, patients, um, just the one small healed infarct, meaning it wasn't even the cause of death, less than one in a 1,000, whereas here in the U.S., heart disease is an epidemic. Here's a list of diseases commonly found here and in populations that eat and live like the U.S., but are rare or even non-existent in patients, in populations that eat diets centered around whole plant foods. These are, are among our most common diseases, like obesity. Hiatal hernia, um, uh, one of the most uh, common problems of the stomach. Varicose veins and hemorrhoids, most common uh, venous, or diseases of veins. Uh, number two cancer killer, colon cancer. 
Diverticular disease, number one disease of the intestine. Appendicitis, number one cause of emergency abdominal surgery. Gallbladder disease, number one cause of non-emergency abdominal surgery, as well as ischemic heart disease, our most common cause of death. Here, but a rarity among plant-based populations. Heart disease, therefore, is a choice. It's like cavity. If you look at the teeth of people who lived over 10,000 years before the invention of the toothbrush, pretty much no cavities. Didn't brush a day in their lives, no Listerine, no water pick, yet no cavities. Why? Because candy bars hadn't been invented yet, right? Simple, right? Oh, why did George Washington? Well, you know, there are few people, go back in history, that have diseases of royalty, right? When you think of gout, heart disease, obesity, who got those diseases? It was the people, the kings and queens that ate like, but now, modern day America, we can eat like, you know, kings for breakfast, queens for lunch, Right? But, um, but among populations that weren't eating like royalty, weren't eating these rich diets, um, there was, uh, they didn't have these kinds of problems. So wait a second. Why do people continue to get cavities when we know they're preventable through dietary changes? Well, because, you know, the um, pleasure people derive from dessert, you know, kind of... Uh, you know, outweighs the cost and discomfort of the dentist chair. And look, that's fine, right? Look, as long as people understand the consequences of their actions, right? As a physician, what more can I do? If you decide, right, you're an adult, decide the benefits outweigh the risk for you and your family, then go for it. I certainly enjoy the occasional indulgence. I've got a good dental plan, all right? But what if instead of the plaque on our teeth, we're talking about the plaque building up inside of our arteries. Another disease that can be prevented through diet. Then what are the consequences for us and our families? Right? Now we're not talking about scraping tartar anymore. Now we're talking life and death. The most likely reason all of our loved ones will die is heart disease, right? It's still up to each of us to make up our own minds as to what to eat and how to live, but we should make these choices consciously, right? Educating ourselves about the predictable consequences of our actions. Atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, begins in childhood. By age 10, the arteries of nearly all kids have fatty streaks, the first stage of the disease. And then these plaques start forming in their 20s, get worse in their 30s, and then can start killing us off. In our heart, it's a heart attack. In our brain, the same disease is a stroke. In our limbs, it can mean gangrene, in our aorta, an aneurysm. Right? If there is anyone here today over the age of 10, <laughs> then the question isn't whether or not to eat healthy to prevent heart disease. It's whether or not we want to eat healthy to reverse the heart disease that we already have. Right 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 Ornish Nesselstyn proved you can reverse heart disease, not just prevent it, not just stop it in its tracks, but reverse heart disease, open up arteries without drugs, without surgery, just with a healthy plant-based diet. But look, we don't want to wait for our first heart attack to start reversing our arteries and re reversing our heart disease, unclogging our arteries. Um, and that's because... For half the people that die from heart disease, they die from what's called sudden cardiac death, meaning your first symptom is your last. 
It's defined as people dying within 60 minutes of their first symptom of heart disease. They feel a little chest pain, 60 minutes, they're maybe with their family, 60 minutes later they're gone from this earth. That's half the people that die from heart disease. So they don't get a chance. You know, they, uh, you know even if they, you know, uh, if they, 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 they tell the paramedics to, you know, to, to not you know, make the detour to the fast food restaurant on the way, there, it's just too late. That's why we can't wait for our first symptoms. We can start reversing a heart disease right now. We can start reversing the heart disease in our kids tonight. Cancer is killer number two. The Pritikin Research Foundation um, uh, did a really elegant series of experiments, but let me just uh, throw some quick stats. This is the largest study ever to look at um, uh, diet and cancer, looking at uh, about a half million people, uh, found the incidence of all cancers combined uh, lower among those eating vegetarian um, compared to those eating meat. Um, And the worst, uh, the most striking um, uh, uh, finding was how low the risk was for some of these fastest growing cancers like lymphomas, leukemias, these liquid cancers. And the worst meat out of all the ones, of all the the animal products they looked at um, was actually poultry consumption. Um, they got about uh, two to three times the odds. So this is non-Hoskins lymphoma follicular leukemia, these other lymphomas, leukemias. Two to three times the risk for just every 50 grams of poultry consumption. That's like a quarter of a chicken breast every day. They triple our risk of these cancers. In fact, the, the relationship between meat and cancer is such that in the journal Meat Science, they asked, should we become vegetarians or can we make meat safer? This is what they're... They're coming up with all these additives to add to the meat to, uh, for example, suppress the toxic effects of the heme iron, the blood-based iron in meat. Now, they're still kind of under, uh, under study, but could provide what they call an acceptable way to prevent cancer because reducing meat consumption completely out of the question, obviously. Um, uh, their concern is that should the National Cancer Institute recommendations to reduce meat consumption be adhered to, yeah, sure, cancer incidence may be reduced, but... Farmers in the meat industry would suffer important economical problems. For those of us more worried um, about the suffering caused by this industry rather than the suffering of the industry, what happens if you put cancer on a plant-based diet? And this is where the Pritikin Research Foundation came in. Did these really elegant series of experiments, simple experiments. You take people, put them on different diets, You draw their blood, you drip their blood on human cancer cells growing in a petri dish, and you see just whose blood is better at suppressing cancer growth. So they were part of the team that worked with Dr. Dean Ornish um, uh, to uh, take men with prostate cancer, uh, put them on a plant-based diet for a year, Um, and this is what they found. They found that the blood of even those eating the standard American diet suppressed cancer growth. I mean, if it didn't, most of us would be dead right now. It's just that uh, though men who ate a plant-based diet for a year, their blood suppressed cancer growth about seven times better. The blood circulating through the bodies of these men uh, gained the power to significantly slow down cancer cell growth. Now, but this was for men on uh, and uh, prostate cancer. For women, number one cancer killer among young women is breast cancer. They wanted to repeat the study using women and breast cancer cells, but look, they didn't want to wait a whole year to get the results. Um, So they said, let's see what a plant-based diet can do within two weeks against three um, uh, uh, um, uh, lines of uh, human breast cancer. Uh, So this is the before picture, cancer cell growth powering weight 100%, and then this is after just two weeks eating healthy. This is a representative slide. Um, kind of under the microscope, basically they lay down a carpet of human breast cancer, they drip on the blood of women eating the standard American diet, and then they do the same, then they put them on a, a healthy diet for two weeks, and then they do it again. And so they act as their own controls, before and after. Um, so this is uh, women eating the standard American diet. You can see, even if you're eating a pretty poor diet, you can kind of break up some of the cancer, but two weeks eating healthy and their blood can do this, Right? Their body's just cleaned up. It's like they're a whole new person inside. Um, uh, Now, slowing cancer uh, growth is nice, but getting rid of it is even better. This is what's called tunnel imaging. 
uh, which measures DNA fragmentation or cell death, where dying cells light up as little white spots. As you can see, again, even if you're eating a crappy diet, you can kill off a few cancer cells, but you take these same women just two weeks later eating healthy, and their bodies can do this. Which raises the question, what kind of, what kind of you know, blood do we want, right? Do we want blood that just kind of you know, rolls over when new cancer cells pop up? Or do we want a bloodstream circulating to every nook and cranny in our body with the power to slow down and stop it. Um, now this was, and so this is what's, uh, again, measuring uh, program cell death before and after. Now, but this was before and after um, a plant-based diet and exercise. They had these women going out walking 30 minutes a day. You say, well, wait a second. If you do two things, diet and exercise, how do you know diet had anything to do with it? So they decided to find out. So they, uh, this is what we saw before the diet and exercise group. Um, this is uh, measuring program cell death, cancer cell clearance. And as you can see, now this was, this group, a um, uh, healthy diet, plant-based diet and daily exercise, just like walking, moderate exercise, for 14 years on average. All right, and you can see the cancer cell clearance they got. Compare that to your average uh, standard American uh, um, diet person. Um, their cancer cell clearance is essentially non-existent. All right. Okay, but we've already seen that. This is the interesting group in the middle. So this group, 14 years of the standard American diet, but 14 years of daily, strenuous, hour-long exercise like calisthenics, literally an hour a day in the gym, seven days a week for 14 years. So that's thousands of hours in the gym. How did they do? You see a little burger in their hand. All right. (laughs) They wanted to know if you exercise long enough, If you exercise hard enough, can you rival some strolling plant eaters? Let's see what happened. Exercise worked, no question. But nothing appears to kind of kick more cancer butt than a plant-based diet. Here's that uh, same tunnel imaging we saw before. Even if you're a couch potato eating fried potatoes, you're not totally defenseless. You can kill off a few cancer cells. You exercise for thousands of hours, and you can kill off cancer cells left and right, but nothing appears more powerful than eating a plant-based diet. The question is why? And actually, normally I kind of skip this section, but I know know this, I thought this crowd could take a little extra science. Um, um, And that is, and the question, because it's just, it's shocking. How can, within two weeks, it's like you're an entirely different person, how could you so dramatically improve your cancer defenses in such a short time? Well, we actually found out recently. Um, they finally figured out the, the underlying mechanism for these anti-cancer effects. And these um, experiments actually go back over a decade. And the reason, even though they're really phenomenal work, the reason I didn't cover it, the reason there weren't videos on the website is because there wasn't a mechanism. I was not satisfied. I wanted to know why. Um, And they finally figured it out. Um, And it involves, it's a fascinating detective story, and I have lots of videos that talk about how they figured it out, but I'll just kind of skip to the chase. But it has to do with little people and big people, and has to do with big dogs and little dogs. And uh, marshmallows, tinker toys, and cannibalism, vegan bodybuilders, on it. It's a great, I encourage people to check it out, but uh, jump to the chase, IGF-1. You just heard the last speaker talk about insulin-like growth factor 1, which is this cancer-promoting growth hormone involved, as you heard, in every stage of cancer cell initiation, promotion, spread, um, and growth. And you go on a uh, healthy plant-based diet and exercise, and you drop, within two weeks, your IGF-1 levels. Um, and you do it for years. It is that 14-year group. Um, you drop your levels even better. So the benefits continue to accrue the longer you do it. And your levels of IGF-1 binding protein go up. IGF-1 binding protein is like your body's emergency break. It, uh, it, it's your body's way to prevent uncontrolled growth in the body um, uh, by uh, your, uh, so um, within just two weeks, you can lower your IGF-1 levels 
Um, but what about all the IGF-1 you had, IGF-1 production you can lower within two weeks? What about all the IGF-1 you have circulating from the bacon and eggs you had you know, three weeks ago? Well, your, your liver releases this snatch squad of binding proteins to pull excess IGF-1 out of your system um, and uh, by uh, within just two weeks, your binding um, uh, capacity goes up, and you keep up with a healthy diet for years, your binding capacity goes up even further. Um, and this is the experiment that really nailed IGF-1 as the villain. This is what we saw before. You go on a healthy diet, cancer cell growth drops like a rock, cancer cell death shoots up, which is what we want. Here's the critical group here. What they did is they added back to the cancer cells just the amount of IGF-1 banished from their system, added back to the cancer um, um, uh, just the amount that was banished by eating healthy, and what happens? Um, you eliminate the diet and exercise effect. It's as if you never started eating healthy at all. And so this is how we know that um, by... Uh, by uh, um, eating, in this case, it's actually the animal protein. Eating animal protein, uh, we boost our liver's uh, production of IGF-1, and that boosts cancer growth. But we can drop that again within just weeks. But raises the question, how low does one have to go? And I talk about um, uh, uh, a number of follow-up studies that have looked at vegetarians versus vegans versus meat eaters, and it turns out it is the animal protein that's boosting IGF-1, so it doesn't matter, as you heard last, whether it's dairy protein, egg protein, meat protein, um, that uh, vegetarians did not have significantly lower IGF-1 levels than meat eaters, only the vegans, only those kind of uh, moving towards uh, wholly plant-based diets were able to significantly lower their IGF-1 levels. But let me move on. We've got 13 leading causes of death to go. <coughs> um, the top three causes of death used to be heart disease, cancer, stroke. Oh, that's so 2011. Now it's heart disease, cancer, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, respiratory diseases like emphysema. Thankfully, they can be prevented with a, um, help prevented with a plant-based diet, maybe even treated with a plant-based diet. This is really exciting. Um, uh, with emphysema, we used to think you get worse, 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 then you die. Like di we used to think that with diabetes, type 2 diabetes, you get diabetes, you get worse, 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 you lose your kidneys, you lose your eyesight, you lose your toes, and then you die. Okay. But now we know, no, not only can type 2 diabetes be prevented, we can treat it, reverse it, cure it. And, uh, but for the first time, this study um, showed that you can actually show an improvement in lung function. What was this miracle intervention? It was adding a few servings of fruits and vegetables to the daily diet. That's all. Actually got an improvement. They, they actually had an improvement in lung function, whether it's the anti-inflammatory effects, the antioxidant effects, we don't know. But that, from a clinical standpoint, very exciting work. But wait a second. If adding plants to our diet can improve lung function, wouldn't be easier, the tobacco industry figured, to just add fruits to cigarettes. And indeed, the uh, addition of acai berries to cigarettes evidently has a protective effect against emphysema and smoking mice. <laughs> Who would have thunk it, right? Next, they're going to start you know, adding berries to meat. I couldn't make this stuff up. Here it is. Adding fruit extract, adding fruit extracts to burger patties was not without its glitches. Um, the blackberries dyed the burgers with this distinct kind of purplish color that kind of turned people off. Though you can evidently improve the tenderness of lamb carcasses if you infuse them before rigor mortis sets in with kiwi fruit juice. You can even improve the nutri nutritional profile of frankfurters by adding powdered grape seeds, <laughs> though there were concerns that some of the grape seed particles were visible in the final product. You know, if there's one thing we know about hot dog eaters, it's that they're picky about what's in their food. <laughs> oh, oh, pig anus, okay, but grape seeds, ew! Stroke comes in at number four. Preventing strokes is all about eating potassium-rich foods. Potassium, from the words pot ash, take any plant, put it in a pot, reduce it to ash, add some water, boil it off, left with a white residue, which is known as pot ash. That's how they got the name, potassium. Um, uh, and the only reason I say that is because that's just, uh, it shows you where potassium is found, uh, predominantly in the plant kingdom. 
Who can tell me one food particularly high in potassium? There we go. Bananas, right? Yeah. I don't know if, uh, if, um, Chiquita just had a great PR team or something. I don't know why that's like the one thing everybody knows about nutrition. Turns out bananas don't even make the top 50 sources of bananas. Coming in at number 86, right behind fast food vanilla milkshakes. It goes fast, then bananas. So what are the, that's a good question. So uh, where are our top sources? Um, uh, so one and two are tomato and orange concentrates. That's not really fair. In terms of whole foods, though, it's greens, beans, and dates. Super healthy foods we should try to fit into our daily diet. Next on the list, in fact, look, and again, bananas down 86. And look at the next leading cause of death. Actually, it could be dangerous. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Three years ago, Alzheimer's disease was our eighth leading cause of death. Two years ago, it was our seventh leading cause of death. Right? And now, number six, four million Americans now stricken with Alzheimer's disease. Now, we have known for decades that those eating meat, red meat, white meat, doesn't matter, have between two and three times the risk of becoming demented. And the longer one goes without eating meat, the lower one's risk falls. But, again, we've known about this for decades. What's new, the exciting new research, is on treating Alzheimer's with natural plant-based remedies um, like saffron, um, uh, which beat out placebo and works just as well as the leading drug, Aricep, prescribed for Alzheimer's, of course, without the side effects. Um, I also have videos coming out on the role of curcumin, which is the yellow pigment in the spiced turmeric, which you can buy anywhere, super cheap. Um, but so certainly you know anybody um, with this dread disease, uh, go over and make them some paella. Um, I, and, and of course, all those videos are up on the site if you're interested. Uh, diabetes, seventh leading killer. Thankfully, di- type 2 diabetes can be prevented with a plant-based diet, can be treated, cured, reversed in many cases with a plant-based diet. Um, and uh, so here's the latest, the Ventus II study, which is the largest study on plant-based eating in North America to date. So compared to non-vegetarians, those that just eat fish may or may not have uh, slightly lower rates of diabetes. Those that cut out all meat certainly do, um, and those uh, eating totally plant-based diets um, have much lower rates. And critically, this is after adjusting for BMI. After You say, well, of course vegans have low rates of diabetes. They're so skinny on average. But no, no, no. Even at the same weight... Vegans have just a fraction of the diabetes. But it does kind of raise the question, why are vegans, on average, um, uh, so skinny? So if you look at um, BMI, body mass index, um, uh, so anything over um, uh, 25 is considered overweight. Anything over uh, 30 is obese. Um, And we used to call anything under 25 normal weight. It's no longer normal. Um, So now we just call it ideal weight. Um, and this is why it's not normal. Meat eaters are up at 28.6. Flexitarians, people that just eat meat kind of you know, on a weekly basis, Sunday roast, something like that, not on a daily basis, they're doing better. But look, even, it, even vegetarians in the United States are on average overweight. It's based on tens of thousands. So really, it's, so only those eating kind of more towards the extreme of plant-based eating, um, uh, centering their diets around whole plant foods, where they're really the only dietary group that we have that actually is, on average, ideal weight. And you say, well, why? Um, well, they, it turns out they eat um, some fewer calories, but not that many. Fewer. So that's about a 35-pound difference. So that's the average amount of weight loss for people moving from standard American diet to a vegan diet. It comes out about 30 pounds, 35 pounds. That's what the clinical studies show. And so, yeah, they eat slightly fewer calories. You know, plant foods are, you know, have a lot of water and fiber and you feel fuller. But not that, not 35 pounds. I mean, you know. And so a number of theories, I've talked about them over the years. Maybe um, uh, it's because uh, vegetarians have more of this fat-burning enzyme in our mitochondrial little power plants in our cells um, called carnitine palmitoyl oil translase, um, upregulated um, in vegetarians for some reason. We're not exactly sure why. Um, it's possible we have different types of gut bacteria. In fact, uh, recently in the New England Journal, um, a really interesting study how very quickly, kind of within days, you can change the entire um, you know, ecosystem 
um, taking vegans, putting them on a, um, a uh, adding meat to their diets. Um, and, uh, and this actually may affect how we extract energy from our diets. Um, it may be these, uh, these so-called obesogens, these, uh, these uh, endocrine-disrupting chemical pollutants that build up in the meat supply may be playing a role. There's even a, a poultry virus um, in, in chicken that may be causing uh, a weight gain. But here's, uh, here's the latest. This is the um, largest study ever to look at this question. We're talking hundreds of thousands of people. Um, followed for years, and their objective was, what was the association between meat consumption and weight gain? And this is what they found. Meat consumption associated with weight gain in basically every group, um, and suggesting, of course, a decrease in meat consumption to improve weight management. This was after controlling for smoking and exercise. But here's the kicker. This is after controlling for calories. So you have two people eating the same number of calories. The person eating more meat will gain more weight. They even determined how much more. Um, so basically, you ate um, uh, uh, 250 grams of meat a day, kind of like a steak a day, would lead to an annual weight gain 422 grams higher than the weight gain experience if you had the exact same number of calories in your diet, but you're just eating less meat. And after a few years, you can put a, cu a couple pounds on just because of that effect. Um, and uh, steak was nothing. The strongest relation uh, may be with poultry intake. So for example... Um, if you eat a quarter pounder every day, this is how much um, weight you'd add um, on um, in addition to the calories that actually found in that quarter pounder. Processed meat is worse if you had a ham sandwich, the exact same number of calories as the burger. Um, you'd uh, actually gain more weight. Um, and then, But here's chicken. This is a half a chicken breast a day. Um, and again, this is above and beyond the calories actually found in that chicken. And so, of course, they conclude, indicate meat in intake associated with weight gain. This is after adjusting for calories, therefore in favor of the public health recommendation to decrease meat consumption for health improvement. What did the National Cattlemen's Beef Association have to say about that study? It was, after all, the largest ever done. Funny story. Don't have time to get into it, but check it out if you're interested. Um, and then I talk about the PCRM's work, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Now, taking this, putting it in a workplace setting, what happens if we actually change cafeterias and it's very exciting if people are interested in that kind of work as well. Next on the list, kidney failure. Kidney failure, a plant-based diet can help prevent kidney failure, can actually be used to treat um, kidney failure. You say, why? Because kidneys are highly vascular organs. Um, that's why they look so red when you cut them open. Uh, and so if plant-based, uh, so if the standard American diet is so toxic, to um, arteries in our heart, brain, and pelvis, leading to heart attacks, strokes, and sexual dysfunction, respectively, what might be they be doing to our poor kidneys? Well, long story short, Harvard researchers found three dietary risk factors and only three um, for um, worsening kidney function. What they were doing is measuring something called proteinuria, loss of protein in the urine. You're not supposed to be losing protein in the urine. Your whole point of your kidneys is to hold on to the good stuff. When you do start losing protein, um, it shows your kidneys are starting to fail. What are the three dietary risk factors? Number one, animal protein. Number two, animal fat. Number three, cholesterol. Right? So it wasn't the amount of protein. It wasn't the amount of fat. Specifically the animal protein. Specifically the animal fat and cholesterol, all three of which is only found in one place, and that is in animal products. If you do a cross-sectional study snapshot in time, vegans have uh, better uh, kidney function, and you can actually take people with kidney failure um, and treat them with a pure vegetarian diet and see dramatic differences within just one week, which is a physician I'm most excited about. Next on the list, we are deep right now in flu season, New York and everywhere else in the country. You say, well, wait a second, what possible role could diet play with uh, dying from the flu or a lower respiratory tract infection like pneumonia. Um, well, um, obviously, you haven't heard about the, um, the immunostimulatory effects of kale. Is there anything kale cannot do? <laughs> um, so there's a, there's a whole long list. So I have lots of articles talking about the role that blueberries and mushrooms and all sorts of things can play in boosting our immune system. In this um, study, they took older men and women um, and put the... And all they did, they didn't take meat out of the diet, nothing. Just added a few servings of fruits and vegetables to the daily diet right before they were getting their Pneumovax vaccination, their pneumonia vaccination. This is what they had. 
Um, this is what they found. They found a significant boost in protective antibody response in those eating five servings of fruits and vegetables a day compared to those eating two. Significantly boost immune response. What was this miracle thing that it just had a few servings of fruits and vegetables? That's how powerful plants can be. Next on the list, suicide. Okay, now what role could a diet play in suicide? Well, you know, two years ago, I profiled this um, important study. Cross-sectional study found that those eating plant-based diets had significantly improved mood, less depression, less anxiety, less stress. Um, but this is a cross-sectional study, meaning a snapshot in time, so you can't prove cause and effect. Maybe people who are mentally healthy go on to eat healthy and not the other way around. What you need is the gold standard in nutritional science, which is an interventional study. You take people, you change their diet, see what happens, and that's what this group, group of researchers did. Um, they took a people, um, and we mean the standard American diet, took out meat, took out fish, took out poultry, actually took out eggs as well, because they thought it was the arachidonic acid, this, um, this pro-inflammatory omega-6 fatty acid found predominantly in, in chicken and eggs um, in our diets. They thought that was causing what's called neuroinflammation, brain inflammation, which was impairing their uh, uh, mental functioning. So they removed that and saw significant improvement in mood within just two weeks. They can take you know, drugs like Prozac months to take an effect. Significant improvement in mood after just two weeks. And of course, the only side effects are good ones. What about uh, the role of diet and uh, septicemia or bloodborne inf invasive bloodborne infections? Well, certainly, you can get you know something like Salmonella, E. coli, burrow through the intestinal wall into your bloodstream, um, or in women actually crawl up um, into um, uh, into their uh, urethra. Um, so we've known that uh, that urinary tract infections in women. Um, they, um, the, the bacteria that cause your, um, bladder infections actually comes from the fecal floor, which just kind of creeps up into the bladder. But we didn't know where this reservoir of bladder-infecting um, bacteria was coming from and, until now. Um, chicken, that's where this reservoir, these special types of E. coli um, that cause bladder infections come from. We now have DNA fingerprinting proof um, of this direct link um, uh, um, between uh, chickens um, colonizing the duck, guts of women which then later leads to literally millions of infections, um, bladder infections, which can turn serious um, and actually uh, become uh, systemic and life-threatening. Wait a second. You can't sell unsafe cars. You can't sell unsafe toys. How is it even legal to sell unsafe meat? Well, they do it by blaming the consumer. Uh, quoting one uh, USDA uh, poultry microbiologist, look, raw meats are not idiot pro, right? They can be mishandled when they are. It's like handling a hand grenade. You pull the pin, someone's going to get hurt. Now, while some may question the wisdom of selling hand grenades in supermarkets, <laughs> our microbiologist disagrees, thinks the consumer has the most responsibility, but just refuses to accept it. Right? Um, uh, you know, it's like a car company saying, yeah, we installed faulty brakes, but it's your fault for not putting your kid in a seatbelt, right? Um, this is what uh, the head of the CDC's food poisoning division had to say about this blame the victim attitude from the meat industry. Is it reasonable that if a consumer undercooks a hamburger, their three-year-old dies? Is that reasonable? Not to worry, the meat industry's on it. They just got FDA approval for a bacteria-eating virus to spray on, um, on the meat, these so-called bacteriophages attack the bacteria, the salmonella, et cetera, that cause um, the disease. Now, there certainly have been concerns expressed about the ability of these bacteria-eating viruses to spread toxin genes between bacteria, especially given the difficulties of preventing large numbers of these viruses from being released in the environment from the slaughter plants. It could, even, it could also allow the meat industry to become even more complacent about food safety, kind of like the quick fix, techno fix argument about irradiation. Um, uh, the, uh, um, uh, who cares how much fecal matter is in the meat, right, if you can just blast it with enough radiation to effectively sterilize it in the end. Now, the industry is concerned about consumer acceptance of these bacteria-eating viruses. It may present somewhat of a challenge, so, of course, they're not going to label it or anything. But if you think that's going to be a challenge, check out their other bright idea. 
The effective extracted housefly pupae on pork preservation, sciencey way of saying they want to smear a maggot mixture on the meat. It's a low cost. Think about it. <laughs> Look, maggots live off of rotting flesh. Yet at the same time, however, you know, there's no reports of maggots having any serious diseases. So, hey, they must be filled with some kind of antibacterial something, right? So let's take some maggots, wash them off, towel them off, a little Vitamix action, and voila! <laughs> Safer meat. We talked about kidney failure. What about liver failure? We have known for decades that one can treat liver failure um, with uh, a plant-based diet and, um, and decrease the amount of toxins that would build up in the blood um, uh, without, um, uh, otherwise, with a, without a fully functional liver to detoxify one's blood eating meat. I do have to admit, though, there is one group of people eating plant-based diets um, with worsening liver function. Uh, they're called alcoholics. You're living off of corn and potatoes and grapes, still not do strictly plant-based. But not doing good. It's not clear what to... <clears throat> Next on the list, essential hypertension. Essential is uh, essentially only found in people with who eat meat. Again, we've known about this forever. This is 74 out of Hopkins. Um, that uh, consumption of food of animal origin highly significantly associated with blood pressure. This is after weight um, has been accounted for. Again, even at the same weight, just a fraction of the risk. This is the latest. Um, oh, so when we kind of fast forward 39 years later. Um, so this, again, out of the Adventist 2 study. Again, here's the hypertension. So, again, compared to meat eaters, and these are Adventist meat eaters. These are healthy. They don't eat a lot of meat, significantly less meat than regular people. And they're healthy. You know, they, they don't smoke. They, don't, they have these other kind of healthy lifestyle behaviors. All right. So compared to healthy meat eaters, if you go on kind of what they call a semi-vegetarian diet, again, just kind of weekly as opposed to daily meat eating, Cut your risk of this leading killer high blood pressure, 23%. And that's why people die of strokes, right? They have the high blood pressure. All right, 23%. Now, look, you cut out all meat except fish, you just drop your risk 38%. Cut out all meat, period, you just cut your risk more in than half. Though, to fully exploit the power of diet, um, one really has to move towards um, a fully plant-based diet. But check it out. You see the same thing. Look at diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Again, a stepwise progression. The more and more plant-based one's diet gets. And as we saw before, BMI, over 25 is overweight. Um, the only um, uh, group that's ideal weight were the vegans. But what this shows, look, it's not all black and white. I don't want people going away thinking, oh, well, I got to, you know. No, anything we can do to move our diet in a healthy direction can significantly, look at this, cut in half, just significantly improve our, and so look, it can be a process. We can improve our diets as we go along, but any step in that direction, you can get an almost immediate benefit in terms of chronic disease risk. Uh, how long does it take um, to lower one's blood pressure in a healthy diet? 12 days, actually 11 days. This is uh, McDougal. Uh, Dr. McDougall out in Santa Rosa, California, took 500 meat eaters, put them on a plant-based diet, got about a 6% drop in blood pressure um, within 11 days. And that was people came in with normal blood pressure who didn't even need it. Those who came in with high blood pressure got about twice the benefit. And again, less than even two weeks. Um, uh, number, killer number 14 is Parkinson's disease. Um, uh, what can a plant-based diet do? for Parkinson's disease. Well, we know that every single study, prospective study ever done on looking at dairy or milk consumption and Parkinson's found an increased risk of Parkinson's disease. You say, why? Well, one possibility is that dairy products, we know that dairy products in the United States are contaminated with neurotoxic chemicals. We have substantial evidence suggesting exposures to the pesticides and pollutants increase Parkinson's disease risk. We have autopsy studies finding higher levels of these pollutants in the brains of Parkinson's patients than compared to people who didn't die of Parkinson's. And some of those compounds are present at low levels in 
dairy products. They're talking about compounds like tetrahydroisoquinoline, which is Parkinsonism-related compound found predominantly in cheese, actually. But even the levels in cheese are not very high. The concern is that they just may, these neurotoxins may accumulate in the brain over long periods of consumption. And any of those who've been following my, uh, following my website, you know, uh, last year um, I also did a video on treating Parkinson's, successfully treating Parkinson's with a plant-based diet as well. Very exciting. Um, and finally, 15... Oh, it's pneumonitis, aspiration pneumonia caused by difficulty swallowing, secondary to a stroke, or Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, all things we've already covered. So here we go. Here's our top 15 killers. Right? And a plant-based diet can help prevent nearly all of them, can be used to treat more than half of them, and may even reverse the course of disease in some of them, including, in many cases, our top three killers. Anyone want to solve the health care crisis? I have a suggestion. <laughs> now, look, you can take drugs too, right? Uh, you know, cholesterol-lowering drugs for heart disease, uh, you know, sugar pills or insulin injections for diabetes. You usually takes a couple blood pressure types of blood pressure pills to drink blood, bring your blood pressure under control. But that's the beauty of diet. It's not like there's one diet if you want to protect your liver. Oh, and then you got to go on the different kidney diet if you want to protect your kidneys. Oh, but if you care about your heart, family history, okay. Then, no, it's one diet to rule them all, right? Um, uh, and, uh, and what about side effects, right, of the drugs? I'm not talking a little rash. Side effects kill. An estimated 106 thousand Americans every year deaths from adverse drug reactions. Not overdose, not illicit drugs. These are drugs prescribed by doctors wiping out over 100,000 people, taken as directors, wiping out over 100,000 people every year in the United States. Say, wait a second. 106,000 deaths? Well, what that means that the sixth leading cause of death is doctors. The sixth leading killer in the United States is me. <laughs> Thankfully, I can be prevented with a plant-based diet. Uh, indeed, no, if you actually look at studies, uh, this is uh, uh, from the original Adventist study, those compared to um, vegetarians, those eating vegetarian, meat eaters twice as likely to be on aspirin, sleeping pills, tranquilizers, antacids, painkillers, blood pressures, medications, laxatives, of course, um, as well as insulin, right? So a plant-based diet is good for people that don't like taking drugs, don't like paying for drugs, and don't like risking drug side effects. Although, you know, there are, you know, plant-based diets have side effects of their own. Side effects include uh, fewer chronic diseases, fewer allergies, fewer surgeries, fewer drugs, fewer hospitalizations. Um, and so this is the surgery stuff. This is, I mean, so I, I just talked about the big killers here, but fewer you know, varicose veins and hemorrhoids and uh, gallbladder disease, fewer hysterectomies even. Um, and then in terms of other diseases that I didn't mention, um, well, uh, less rheumatoid arthritis um, and more importantly, fewer diseases overall. That's what you get, eating healthy, fewer diseases overall. This is the latest side effect of plant-based eating. Oh, well, actually, we'll do allergies just for a moment. This is just fascinating. The, you know, the concern, when I read that adding a few servings of fruits and vegetables can so boost your immune system. I was like, well, wait a second. What about the millions of Americans suffering from autoimmune diseases or seasonal allergies? Their immune system is a little bit too boosted. Might eating healthy make things even worse by tipping them even farther? So that's why I was so excited to see this news. It turns out that no, in fact, um, uh, compared to vegetarian women, non-vegetarians um, have 30% more chemical allergies, more 24% more asthma, more drug allergies, more bee sting allergies, more hay fevers. I mean, so in, 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 in not only, but, so by eating healthy, we get the best of both worlds, right? We support our disease-fighting sectors of our immune system, but we down-regulate um, uh, these kind of, uh, these overarching um, autoimmune and uh, inflammatory reactions. And so we just get that kind of sweet spot in the middle by eating healthy. Here's the latest side effect of plant-based eating. Fewer cataracts. That's what we get. 
Um, in fact, you can tell there's a study done in Europe because they, what they call the heavy meat eating group, the heavy meat eaters, one serving a day. Those are the heavy, all right. But compared to the heavy meat eating group, those that um, cut their meat consumption in half um, may drop their risk of cataracts. The leading cause of vision loss in this country, 15%. Cut out all meat except fish, just drop 21%. Um, cut out all meat, period, just drop 30%. Again, you can continue to get more and more benefit the more and more plant-based one's diet gets. At the same time, every little bit helps, right? Um, and so I don't want people leaving here. Even just cutting down on meat consumption can significantly lower our risk. Our bodies want to be healthy. They want to heal themselves. And so if you just kick them a little less hard three times a day, um, your body can heal just that much better. All right, so imagine if our nation embraced a plant-based diet, even just cutting down on meat, imagine what that could do. Well, let me leave you with a case study. of, of We're a country that actually gave it a try. Finland, of all places. Finland, after World War II, started packing on the meat, eggs, and dairy. And by the 1970s, Finnish men had the highest levels of heart disease mortality in the world, bumping us down to number two. Well, they didn't want to die, so they got serious. All right, well, we know heart disease caused by high cholesterol, high cholesterol caused by saturated fat intake. So the main focus of this nationwide strategy, let's just reduce the high saturated fat intake. We're saturated fat found. We're here in the U.S. It's cheese, chicken, and cake, basically, or donuts, right? Cheese, chicken, and dessert. Um, so what did they do? All right, well, a berry project was launched to get farmers to switch from dairy farming to berry farming, all right? And indeed, many farmers did switch from dairies to berries. They instituted these kind of friendly cholesterol-lowering competitions between villages to see, like, whose village can get the lower average cholesterol, and then they give out prizes. All right, okay. So how'd they do? Well, look, even, even if there was just a tiny benefit on a population scale, I mean, that could save thousands of lives, right? But instead, remarkably great changes took place. What am I talking about? I am talking about an 80% drop in cardiac mortality across the entire country. 80% of the heart disease gone. And with so much less cancer, so much less heart disease, um, they cut total mortality, extended life uh, by years for both men and women. And look, Finland is no country of vegans, right? It just shows the power of even cutting back on some of these deleterious foods. And now, of course, who's fighting to be scrabbled back on top to be number one? All right. So why doesn't uh, our government make those same recommendations? You know, I have a series of videos talking about the conflicts of interest within the Dietary Guidelines Committees. People actually write um, the official dietary guidelines. And whether they're funded by candy bar companies or the Sugar Association or whether they happen to be a member of McDonald's Advisory Council on Healthy Lifestyles or what about maybe they serve on Coca-Cola's Beverage Institute for Health and Wellness. This is my favorite, Joanna Dwyer, up at Tufts with me. She originally, she was the original Duncan Hines brand girl before she was the official Crisco brand girl before she went on to write the Dietary Guidelines for All Americans. If you read what this committee actually comes up with, you'll see that there is no discussion at all of the scientific research on health consequences of eating meat. Everything I've talked about for the last hour, don't even mention it. Why? Because if the committee actually discussed this research, it'd be unable to justify its, uh, its recommendation to eat meat at all, as research would show that meat increases the risk of chronic diseases, contrary to the whole point of having dietary guidelines. So thus, by simply ignoring the research, the committee is able to reach a conclusion that would otherwise look improper. Right? They can't even talk about the science. What do we know? We know plant-based diet, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, no meat, reverse heart disease, can prevent death from heart disease, may slow the progression of cancer. Um, but again, they can't even talk about 
the signs. And in fact, the 2015 guidelines um, are, uh, are coming out soon. And on Tuesday, I'm actually presenting before the committee. It would be very interesting. So it's me and like the Salt Institute and then the Sugar Association and the Pork Producers Council. It is, uh, it, it is a political education. If you, it's free, it's open to the public, down in Washington, D.C. at NIH. Um, I don't know. Check it out. Tuesday will be fun. They, um, they record them. I don't know if they're available online, but it'd be neat to, I don't know, see me uh, wrestle with the pork producers. Um, all right, so uh, the, the best summary and conclusion of uh, U.S. dietary policy that I've ever been able to find um, was actually uh, summarized in this cartoon that asked, that said, look, the new dietary guidelines have been released. They're talking about the 2010. Uh, they tell us to eat healthier but not so healthy as to noticeably affect any corporate profits. Thank you very much. If you'd like to share what I um, uh, talked about today, um, this is actually taken from uh, um, two DVDs. So this is actually kind of like a two-hour talk, kind of squished down to about 50 minutes because I want to take a lot of time for questions. But, you, but they're both available outside for 10 bucks. All um, uh, proceeds from all the sales of my DVDs, books, speaking engagements, all goes to charity, of course. And I also have uh, copies of my, uh, if you want to go way more in depth and not just cover the main points, I have a series of 16 volumes of, uh, of clinical nutrition and 17 comes out in two weeks and if you signed up on that clipboard I'll send you an email uh, when the new DVD is out um, and if you didn't sign up on this clipboard that should have been circulating around um, whoever has it you can take it back to the table um, and when I'm signing you can sign up as well and of course all my work is available free online at nutritionfacts.org Questions. We have like lots of time. Let's do it. However, oh, and for anyone, I know there's all these live streaming people all over the world. Um, if you want to have a question, call me. 240-252-8078. And it will ring and I will take your question in between questions here. 240-252-8078. Question, yes. Yeah, can you... Uh Explain to me how romaine, for example, I got into this debate with a doctor uh -huh. that romaine was a complete protein because, of course, he asked me, where do I get my protein? Okay. And um, I told him it was a complete protein, and uh, he didn't believe it, so I looked it up on my phone and said it was 17% protein, and it was a complete protein. And he said it's impossible because it's 98% water. Mm. And that's true as well, and I didn't understand it. Oh, that's a great question. Um, if you didn't hear the question, I'll repeat it just for folks if you didn't hear it. Um, uh, if you look at, so folks within the kind of plant-based movement love talking about how broccoli has more protein than steak. <laughs> and by a percentage of calories, which is really all that matters, that's how your body digests, it keeps count, not by weight, not by volume, keeps count by calories. So that's, that's, that's kind of the monetary, you know, that's how food comes in according to the body. So that's legitimate, too. but what they don't realize, so per calorie, more protein, right? But the problem is, or the benefit is, plants are so calorically dilute, have so few calories to actually, yes, the present, by percentage, they're packed with, I mean, if you think of broccoli or, or romaine lettuce, what, is it fat? There's no fat in there. Is it um, starch? No, I mean, it's probably, I mean, that's what the thing's made out of, right? But there's so few calories. Even if 100% of the calories were protein, you'd have to eat like a wheelbarrow of romaine every day. Now, I'm all in favor of big salads. I am. A, you know the big mixing bowls? That's my salad bowl. Absolutely. Big salad every day. Um, but, um, and so, the, so you're kind of both right. Yes. Um, uh, you know, uh, but yeah, they're high in protein. But, but what, what, what's behind that question is this concern about getting enough protein. And that, that, I mean, and so that's the, that, I mean, so, when, if you don't know how to get protein on a plant-based diet, you don't know beans. 
beans, peas, legumes, right? These are uh, lentils. I mean, these are the plant superstar, plant protein superstars. I encourage people to eat legumes every day. Um, and you can get all the protein. You don't have to worry about, oh, am I getting enough protein? Um, so that, I mean, so even the, so that it's not a concern unless one eats um, lots of empty calorie junk foods, right? You live off cotton candy, right? You can get enough calories to actually sustain life, but you're not going to get any protein, you're not going to get anything, anything, right? So uh, unless you're, and look, cotton candy, that's a vegan, right? <laughs> so, I mean, you can, you can eat a vegan diet and not get enough protein by eating cotton candy. Uh, only, kind, right? So, um, so I encourage people not to eat empty calorie junk foods. Um, any variety of foods, but uh, yeah, legumes. I'd love to see people eat lots of legumes. I know, I know, but the thing is, they all thought, oh, I must have beans every day and soy, and I oh. don't. Okay. So I know there's not a worry for a short shortage of protein, but I just didn't understand numerically how could it be 98% water and 17% protein? Oh, so it's, it's by, so, my, I, right, I right, absolutely. So by weight, anything. by weight, it's, but see, the water disappears. When you eat, like, romaine lettuce, your body, if it doesn't have enough water, just absorb it. Um, in fact, there's this, there's this concept, don't drink while you're eating, don't drink water while you're eating, because it, like, I don't know, dilutes, whatever. No, you're, you think your body's that stupid? No, your body, if, you, if there's too much water in your stomach for proper digestion, for all the enzymes and stuff, it just sucks it right out. It goes right through the stomach wall into your bloodstream, right? And if you eat without drinking water, your body floods water into your stomach to get just the right, it's called osmolarity, just the right amount of liquid for proper digestion. Your body's way too smart to be, you know. Oh, anyway, so, um, so when you eat, so if something's 90, so when you eat a whole bunch of romaine lettuce, and it's 98% water, um, that, it doesn't even kind of count. Your body's just like, oh, water, yoink. And then what's left is there's actually very little food. But that's good in the United States of America where we have an epidemic of obesity, where, we don't, where it would be great to fill up your stomach and be like, oh, I'm full, and have no calories in there. It's like water, fiber, like, you know. So the calorie dilute nature of plant foods is actually a benefit with one exception, and that's little kids. Little kids got really little tummies. And when you have really little tummies, if you just gave them big salads, they literally might become calorie not They just might not be able to eat enough food. So in that case, you really, they need to eat calorically dense foods. So like, you know, nuts and dried fruits and smoothies and all sorts of, you know, and beans and whole grains just have, have, you know, enough calories to pack in. Um, uh, but for adults, the fact that a huge salad is basically no calories unless you're putting bacon ranch on top um, is actually a good thing on a population scale. Yes? Thank you uh, for your talk, and also thank you for every, all the work you've done. You've uh -huh. Facts.org, you've converted me into a vegan. So oh, thank great. You. Um, hey. I actually, you know, it's been a couple of months now, and I have questions just in terms of balance. You know, uh, obviously high nutrient density is important, but also macronutrients are important as well. So, you know, like some vegans I've seen kind of emphasize fats, right, like avocados mm. and nuts mm. and, and uh, even coconut. And I see people using coconut oil as well. Mm, yeah. Can you speak a little bit about sure. kind of macronutrient balance? No, sure, right. Balance? No, so there's, you know, there's the 80, 10, 10 folks. There's like people ask me, oh, what's the percentage of protein? As if like... We evolved for millions of years with like internal calculate. No, like we never. You think other animals think about this? Like, no. Our, again, our body's way too smart. The important thing is not macronutrient percent. Is where you're getting that from, right? Is protein good or bad? Well, protein is kidney beans or or pork, right? You say are carbs good and bad? Carbs can be a sweet potato. Or cotton candy, right? What can, what's fat? It can be trans fat, can be lard, or it can be walnuts, one of the healthiest foods, right? So it's meaningless to say well, how much protein you're getting or how much carbon. It's what's the source. And the most important, is it whole or not? Is it a whole food source? You're getting a whole food source of fat, black seeds, walnuts, great, right? Getting a whole food source of carbohydrates, Right? Sweet potatoes, whole grains, brown rice, quinoa, wonderful. Whole grain source of protein, getting your legumes. I mean, that's, that's what you should be thinking. Am I eating a whole food? Right? Or did the industry take out nutrients from the, is it food as grown? Or was there some middle person that took out a whole bunch of stuff, added a whole bunch of crap in to decrease the, to make the price point such that they can make a big profit margin? Whole versus processed. It's probably your best bet.
Thank you. Hi, I was wondering if you could tell us what the benefits of being vegan are with infectious diseases like Lyme. Oh, interesting. There, um, there is no data on diet and Lyme disease, either chronic or acute. So there's just simply, so people can speculate. I'm not one for speculating. There's no data. When there's data, I, I know that is an issue. That's important to people. And so it's something, it's in my PubMed alerts. And if anybody's interested in this, there's something called your taxpayer dollars go to help fund the National Library of Medicine, which is the largest medical library in the world, biking distance from my house. <clears throat> and that's the reason I live there. Um, and they have a service where you sign up. So you go to pubmed.gov, pubmed.gov, and you search. So what you want to do is you want to search for Lyme, spelled with a Y, because you don't want citrus articles. <laughs> a Lyme and diet. You put Lyme diet, right? You press the search button, and then there's a button that says Save Search. You click on Save Search, and it offers to, for free, email you anytime, anywhere in the world, an article is published on Lyme and diet. Because you'll see nothing comes up from your search. Because there's just, there's no, but that doesn't mean tomorrow there's not going to be an article. So I have it. I mean, so that, so I have Lyme and diet in my, so I will get an email anytime and I'll make a video about it, but it might take me a few weeks to get that video up, whereas you'll know that morning and you can have them email you any time of the day. You can even put it in, I want seven o'clock, right? Right? You really like avocados? You can get emailed anytime. Uh, avocado article is published anywhere in the world. It's the coolest thing. And so, of course, I have hundreds of terms. But for whatever you're interested in. And look, let's say an article comes through and you can't make heads or tails of it because it's written in techno speak, right? Or it's written in another language. Or it's, uh, there's a paywall where you can't actually get access to the article. Um, then email me. Email me. I'll get you the article. I, I, I can get any article because I'm near NLM. <laughs> Um, and, and I can try to interpret for you. And it would actually be doing me a favor. Maybe somehow I missed it. Uh, people email me all the time. And there are articles that I must have. I only started my annual reviews, volume one, good, 2007. So b pre-2007 literature, there's new stuff all the time I've never even heard of, just because I wasn't looking at the literature at the time. Um, so pubmed.gov, P-U-B-M-E-D.gov, your taxpayer dollars, hard at work, you should get your money's worth, um, and, uh, and so you're signing up for what are called PubMed Alerts, um, and, uh, and I've got about 6,000 of them sitting in my inbox. Thank you. Uh, has anybody told you you talk fast? I do, and I apologize, but I wanted time for this right here, q &A. I want to thank you for that. And oh. <laughs> my name is John Eagle, and um, I want to get back to the basics. Mm. Um, Ann Wigmore and Dr. George Irk Thomas co-authored a book called Organic Soil. Organic soil is the health of life. Now, uh, Finland did a study. They outlawed chemical fertilizers. The disease rate was equal to the United States. When they outlawed uh, chemical fertilizers, the disease rate dropped to one-tenth of what the United States was. I think we need to get back to the basics and understand where life comes from. Organic sulfur is the, another word for life. And people should evaluate, or maybe you can elaborate a little bit, on organic sulfur. Um, so uh, in terms of, I think this gets to a, a, something that's raised often, this sense of crop nutrient decline. That like, you know, fruits and vegetables ain't what they used to be. Here I go talking about fruits and vegetables. But it really, you know, we're not talking, this is not your grandparents' fruits and vegetables. Our soils are depleted. Um, and so we're just not getting the nutrients that we used to. Um, and so I was curious. And, so, and that's often used by supplement manufacturers um, who are, you know, want to sell you their fancy you know, mineral supplements saying, even if you eat healthy, you're not going to get your, what you need, so here, buy my pills. Okay, so I was interested in evaluating that claim. And so there's a video on the website called Crop Nutrient Decline. You can actually see the graphs and stuff. But uh, crop nutrient decline, the video, if you put in the word crop in the search box up there, it'll pop right up. Um, and what they found is, yeah, it's true, it's kind of true and false. The true part, yeah, there has been uh, a nutrient decline by about 15%. So if you look at some of the major, um, you know, vitamins, 15%. So that means today you have to eat, 
you know, six florets of broccoli to get the same nutrition you got out of five florets of broccoli, you know, 50 years ago. Eat six florets of broccoli. I mean, there's no reason you have to take a pill. I mean, so yes, there was, but it, it didn't have this like, oh my God, our soils are bare and fruits and vegetables are nothing but water. No, I mean, for a broccoli to grow, it has to have a certain bare minimum or it just can't make the little broccoli, you know, it can't make stems, it can't make leaves. There's a certain bare minimum. Now, do we have, should we buy organic? Absolutely, for a wide variety of reasons. Um, uh, but one should never let either concerns about pesticides or concerns about lack of nutrition to dissuade us from stuffing our faces with as many fruits and vegetables as possible. In fact, let me, there's, there's actually a, stu- there's a wonderful, um, there's a study, uh, well, it's actually funded by the petrochemical industry. Let me just say that as a, but, but I mean, it looked like a good work. So this modeling work, uh, this was in uh, Food and Chemical Toxicology last year, that did this uh, kind of complicated uh, modeling to suggest that if, if half of Americans ate a single serving more of fruits and vegetables, conventional fruits and vegetables, we would prevent 20,000 cancer deaths every year. 20,000 people that died of cancer would not have died of cancer if just half of Americans ate one more serving of fruits and vegetables. That's how powerful plants are. Okay, but they did say, okay, because these were pesticide-laden conventional produce, that eating that much, that many pesticides would cause 10 cancer deaths. So overall, uh, we would prevent 19,990 cancer deaths, right? But that just shows the difference. So by eating fruits and vegetables, you get this tremendous benefit. Okay, yeah, but we get a little risk. Eating conventional fruits and vegetables, a little cancer risk, a little bump in cancer risk, right? But So look, why have any risk at all? Choose organic, right? Get all benefit, no risk. But again, because there's such a big difference, um, again, never, um, even the most pesticide-laden produce, the, the Chilean imported grapes and bell peppers and spinach, and strawberries, right? Even the worst of the worst, it's still dramatically um, more. I mean, uh, it, uh, on average, for our health, by you know, by almost ten thousand, right, or a thousand times more benefit than risk. Um, but hey, if they have the organic strawberries right next door, why not get those? Where am I? Yes, over here. Hi. Can a vegan diet uh, reverse osteoporosis in a person who already does weight bearing exercise? Can a vegan diet birth us? Uh, can you reverse, reverse, just stop the progress oh, stop the progression of osteoporosis or uh, reverse it? Um, uh, you well, so weight bearing exercise, right? So you really know. So weight bearing, the way to stop the progression of bone loss um, and strengthen bones is a weight bearing exercise. Just like your muscles, when you don't use them, they waste away. You put your arm in a cast. A couple of weeks later, you have no muscle mass because your body says, why am I making, mu- why am I continuing to keep your muscles up? You're not even using them. Same thing with your bones. Why would your body keep your skeleton going if you're not putting any weight on it? Um, I mean, we think of bones as like just like inanimate structure, but that's because they're taken out of the body. If any surgeon will tell you, b- bone is living, bleeding, you know, tissue, constantly remodeling. And why put any effort into it all if you're, you know, lying on the couch all day? And so we need to jar our bones an hour a day, an hour a day, minimum, seven days a week. That's the most important thing before I put anybody on Fosamax and these bisphosphonates, these other drugs. Um, That's the most important thing we can do. Um, And uh, can we support um, uh, um, healthy bone growth? And maintenance with a healthy diet, absolutely, with potassium and vitamin K, boron, all these other wonderful things. Um, so I encourage people to eat two tablespoons of ground flax seeds every day and all sorts of other things that I talk about in all my bone videos. But the most important thing, use it or lose it. And that says one, five minutes. Hi, you I'm- can just go like this. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, John Shank, and I just have a comment. Uh, I, this is my first conference I've ever been to, oh. and uh, okay. I kind of chose this lifestyle two years ago at Genesis Anti-Aging and Healing Center. Oh. And Brenda Lee spent a lot of time at Hippocrates and among other places to kind of learn this lifestyle. But I went through this huge dip in my weight for years, uh-huh. I mean 20, 30 years, 
and uh, I had trainers and nutritionists, but I'd lose the weight, always gain it back. Sure. And within six months, I lost 68 pounds, ah, over great. six inches off my waist. And ah. today, today is my 59th birthday. But, but with, that, with that said, everything that you said here is so true. Ah, no more you. high blood pressure medicine within five months. No more anti-inflammatories. I had this weird, it would go from my knees to my hip to my ankles. Mm. And the doctors kept saying, well, we think you have gout. To the mm. point where they drew out the fluid to look oh, at the crystals. Yeah. There's yeah. no crystals. Mm. I didn't have gout. Mm. I think it was dairy. It's hard to say what it was because right. when I went vegan, I went to Genesis. I spent months there, five months. Wow. But I lost all that weight and came off all those medications from high blood pressure, cholesterol, um, the anti-inflammatories, Nexium. So the reflex is gone. Oh, fantastic. And I've never gained the weight back. That's you great. know, I've stayed within five pounds of, of, of being around 200, 205 pounds Man. with moderate exercise. And that was an amazing thing to me. I had a personal trainer six days a week, and I was like crying. I was crying. Yeah, my skin became just – people didn't recognize me. Yeah. I would get on airplanes and walk by a friend of mine. And I'm like, hey. And they're, they're like, John. They, people do not That's recognize so me, including my mom even said I had more hair, which I don't actually believe. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> I can't, I, can't, I, I can't attribute my health to this, but I think That's what great. you're saying, if people listen so and right. live a lifestyle like that yeah. and do it and do it faithfully, you won't gain the weight back. My blood tests have never been better. That's I mean, I go, I've been going to Mayo Clinic every year for a physical. I, I, I am an executive of, of a company, in my own company, and I have to go for a, a physical mm. every year. I've been taking the same blood test since 1992. Mm. My doctor called me in. I'm like, great. After all this, uh, he's going to tell uh, me something's wrong. He right. goes, I just want to see this for myself. How would you do this? I want to know how I get my other patients to do this. Your uh, blood tests have never been better. That's fantastic. To the point where I got a, a – I, I had to go and get a, a, a very large insurance policy, which at 59 years old is very hard to do. It's $5 million. Uh, Whole life. I got a premier select rate because uh, of my course. blood test. And yes, the, the agent said – They've never seen anything like it. Yeah. So yeah. I just want to thank no, you. Right. And, and your extraordinary health is really normal health. Like the human body shouldn't just fall apart, right? right. We have this sense that it's just kind of these are inevitable, you know, uh, you know, diseases of aging. Your ticker just kind of conks out. No, that's not how we were built. And that's what these studies show. I was, I was a bicycle racer for 17. I, I raced 17 years ago. I went back to bicycle racing last year. I rode 2,000 miles on my bicycle. And I trained moderately. I'm telling you, I didn't train as hard as I used to with a trainer, and I'd gain and lose the weight. As soon as I get done with the training, I'd gain all the weight back. And it's all about what you put in. And, you know, your body wanted to be this healthy all along. Oh, I feel right? great. I mean, it's just you just had to get out of its way. I mean, you just had to stop kind yeah, of why? You know, it's, when, it's like, you know, something that really struck me in medical school was learning that within eight years of stopping smoking, your lifetime lung cancer risk approaches that of a lifelong non-smoker. Within eight years, your body can clear out all that tar and crap. So if you didn't get lung cancer already. But, um, and, and, and then it's almost as if you didn't smoke at all. Right? I mean, that's remarkable. And so what that tells you is that every day your body wanted to have healthy lungs and try, but then you keep hitting it over and over and over again. And then as soon as you stop, finally... It's been, you know, and same thing. You whack your shin on the, on the coffee table, it hurts, it gets better. But if you whack your shin three times a day for breakfast, lunch, it'll never heal. You go to your doctor and your doctor says, no problem, your shin hurts, I've got painkillers. Take these pills, right? Instead of saying, maybe you should stop whacking yourself three times a day and let your body just take care of itself. Exactly. Well, thank you very thank much. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. <laughs>